Hey, everybody, how's it going? Hey, hey, I see some faces I recognize out there. Well, I know over the years there have been a lot of requests for them, so they're finally here, and I'm happy to present Jen and Sylvia, the Soska Sisters. Well, this is a laid-back kind of environment, so, you know, a couple of oh, nice. here and there. I know, there's it. a kid in the front row, who cares? Oh. A young adult. So, you two almost had to cancel because you're working on a project right now that is pretty much wrapped up, right? Yes, we just actually picture-locked uh, our remake of David Cronenberg's Rabbit. It's 1977. <laughs> first directors ever to remake a Cronenberg film, not the first female directors. There are a couple other guys that were trying, they just didn't make it to the finish line. Oh! oh. <laughs> Too bad, so sad. But we actually uh, were supposed to have locked a week earlier, and we actually locked our edit on Friday from our hotel room because we had to we say- We locked it from our table at Spooky! Yeah, from our table because we were like, we have to be here! We locked Rabbit at Spooky Empire! So, uh, remakes are always, you know, there's, there's always uh, so much weight of responsibility when you're remaking somebody's work. And especially, uh, I read that you guys were highly influenced by David Cronenberg, and he's one of the, one of the people uh, you two looked up to, so what kind of added pressure does that put on you? All the pressure in the entire world. <laughs> but we actually met David last Monday so that pressure is alleviated very considerably for me. Uh, he said some really nice, gracious things. He said the movie ended up where it should, which I was like, that's amazing. I asked him, uh, we told him a lot about the movie, and then I said, you know, David, I only made it for you. And then he goes, you want me to watch it? And I'm like, yes. And then he goes, and then he tells me a story about somebody else's movie, Raw. And he said, somebody asked me to say something nice about that, and then I watched it, and I really liked it. And it was his way of saying, Rabbit, if I watch it and I like it, yes, I will say something. But he also let me know if he hated it, he'd keep it to himself. <laughs> I think he'd tell us secretly if he hated it. I think he would tell me too, he'd be like... But the amazing thing is, to pr even before the film, I mean, he really respected the experience, he likes our work. Uh, he knows a lot, well, we're, we've become friends with Mary Heron, who is just a goddess in her own right, the American Psycho director. So by the time we earned that position across the table from David, he didn't even care that we made the movie. He respected us as artists, which made me think, fuck, why did I make Why did I torture myself with that movie? <laughs> but it, I think it, it made us better filmmakers, because you, making a David Cronenberg movie is Hard. Even and with the whole country supporting you, it's hard. And traditionally, I hate remakes because most of them are soulless cash grabs and they're so disrespectful to the fans, which I identify as being, except Alexander Asha. Alexander Asha is one of those directors who loves the original and you can really see it in his remakes. I actually like his Hills Have Eyes remake more than the original because it's just full of love for him and I think people will see <laughs> our love for Cronenberg in every frame. I mean, we had many of his original crew members. We had four, four of his cats, four actors that he's worked with. Wow. Now, um, you know, a lot of people, when they, when they remake stuff, they do their own interpretation, or sometimes it's more of like a literal, you know, straightforward remake. Like, what's your approach on that when, when you two uh, take on a task like this? I feel we just added our own unique perversion to the movie. I don't think there will ever be a better example of male gaze versus female gaze. Uh, David, no, nothing against him at all. He identifies as male, he's heterosexual, and his films are his fantasy. I'm pansexual. I like to keep my options open. Thank you. <laughs> I've never had that cheer. <laughs> this is Orlando. We're a very inclusive city. Oh, you're like the Canada of the South. Yes. <laughs> 
So uh, when you watch our film, obviously we have Laura Vandervoort as our lead, and she's so beautiful. There's moments where she looks just like Marilyn Chambers because we recreate some of those moments. But you will never see her not in a power position. Even though terrible things happen to her, it's very important for us to make it a story about a woman that we could all relate to. And also, in the original, Rose didn't have a last name. She didn't even have a job. She just had a boyfriend that got her in a horrible car accident. Oh, she's got a boyfriend that gets her in a car accident in this one. David said of Rabbit, uh, one of his themes is love is useless. So we play with that again. I believe love is useless also. Yeah. Romantic. Yeah. I mean romantic love, like that deep soul love is awesome. Speaking of other projects, some news came out the other day uh, that you two will be working on a comic book series or a uh, graphic novel. Thank you Thank so you. much. So Jen and I grew up reading Marvel comics. We've gotten to write for them three times. We got to write Night Nurse, which was 10 pages, which I thought would be the only 10 pages I'd ever write for Marvel. Then they, Neil, uh, Neil, deGrasse, Neil deGrasse Tyson? Yeah, he, he dropped out of Guardians of the Galaxy and they're like, will you do his story? And I'm like, obviously when he drops out, you're like, the twins are the next person. They're far out there. Bill Nye must have been busy. <laughs> and then this month, we have a story in the first Avengers Halloween special, and we might have finally gotten to write Deadpool. I don't know. We might have finally, finally, finally. <laughs> Prove it if you follow every stupid fucking dream, they are achievable. They really, truly are. And we were really excited about the Halloween issue because uh, Marvel has some characters that you're not allowed to do weird shit with. And Captain America is the number one star poster <laughs> child you're not allowed to do anything nasty to. So they let us do something really nasty to her. This story actually came with a joke. They said, let's do this. And we'd be like, ha ha, what if you let us do this to Captain America? We're like, ha ha, I'm gonna do this, ha ha, I'm gonna do this. And they're like, yeah, that's the story. So after that, I really thought they'd never engage us again. And we actually had pitched this Black Widow story along with an Electra story, along with a Wiccan and Hulkling story. That along with a Deadpool story. <laughs> and all four of those stories got thrown out, although everyone said, I love these. It's just, we're not doing a gay story right now. And then Iceman became gay. And I was like, oops, I guess I'm not gay enough to write the gay character. Okay. <laughs> but I'm a redhead enough to do the redheaded girl that's pissed yeah. off. <laughs> I was going to ask. I noticed the hair. I was like, that seems almost like a very fitting you know, homage. We dyed it red for Painkiller Jane, <laughs> which, which might be coming around for us again. Funny, funny story about that one. Our hair will remain red until we get to direct fucking Painkiller Jane or Black Widow. Ah, uh, I, this Black Widow comic could fit into the Marvel Cinematic Universe easily right now. And you know how they made Natasha a little softer? She's sad about the red ledger. This Natasha just got killed by Captain America, so she's so pissed off. She has no, uh... <laughs> She has no mercy for anyone, so she goes somewhere and murders some pedophiles, and you're really gonna enjoy watching it. It's also she's not an Avenger, no rules, and beyond that, no love interest. She's not just some chick to be with the Hulk. What the hell, Joss Whedon? What the hell? What is wrong with you, man? That was a really weird. That was a weird. And Hulk, I got no playback practically. At least they had the one line with uh, Winter Soldier being like, "At least remember me, right?" Because right, right. Yep. But along with our Black Widow, Black Widow had been previously canceled, and so had Winter Soldier. And both Black Widow and Winter Soldier are coming back with their own standalone series. Hopefully, we'll be able to have crossovers. Crossover. Yeah, I've definitely got a, a Bucky and Natasha story in me. It comes out January 2019, and if you like it, please, please buy it. And if you don't like it, please buy it anyway. And, oh, we should also say that one time in Budapest. Remember with Hawkeye? Because what one time in Budapest? Budapest? Uh, I think you and I remember Budapest very differently. <laughs> We're Hungarian, we uh, do it. I love those movies. I'm a huge Marvel fan, so... Oh, like, that's when... why we're sharing a stage with you. We're like, does he read DC? He's cool. Um, but you know, this Black Widow movie, you know, has been circling for quite a while now, yeah. and this could be really great, fortuitous timing. 
I really hope that they do actually come through with making a film for her. They have a director chosen, uh, Kate Shortland or something, I believe. She's an Australian director. That film has been on and off and in development and not actually moving ahead for the longest time. And I think it's because every Avengers or every Marvel movie ends with like a, a space war. We need to dial it back and tell human stories because I think what attracted us to all these superheroes originally is they're ordinary people with extraordinary lives. And we don't have the ordinary people anymore. We don't even have their flaws. Like, what is Tony Stark without his drinking problem? He's just a guy that everything works out for. What's Peter Parker with money? He would never have money, yeah. girls. No, no one would screw him. That's Peter. He doesn't even have with great power comes great responsibility anymore. I'm it's like, a bit of a bummer. It's kind of his deal. He needs to have that struggle. He needs to have something to worry about. Absolutely, because we all have those struggles. And what made Peter Parker so popular as a child is because nothing, nothing ever worked out for him. And a lot of our lives, I mean, things are hard more often than they're like, hey, I'm Tony Stark and I'm doing blow and screwing yeah. chips. I keep praying for a Sam Raimi Spider-Man for like adult oh, Peter, cool. adult Mary Jane. Dude, that would be amazing. Too. Spider-Man 2! Oh, he got it. Spider-Man 2 was a huge influence of Rabbit. Actually. Really? There's a the moment where Laura Vandervoort, I would go over to her and I'm like, Vandy, you just Toby Maguire for me. She's like, I know what that means to you. It's <laughs> Batman Returns. It's Spider-Man 2. It's obviously Rabbit. It's Invisible Monsters. Okay, so I just realized, sitting up here, that I've been kind of selfish with the time here because, you know, I could always... I easily get lost in conversation. Oh, we never shut up. Have you met us? It's okay. Time doesn't exist. So, I was wondering if anybody had any questions from the audience. Feel free to line up, come to the microphone, and don't forget to really speak into it so we can hear you. Yeah, speak your truth. I, I think that microphone might might be off. That's okay. Here you go. I just want to know, what has been the greatest struggle for the two of you since you started in this bigger world of movie making? That's a fantastic question. What? The biggest struggle for me is having the exact, starting at the exact same place as, uh, my male counterparts because I find uh, I work for studios and there's people with less experience than me that don't get checked up on and I have people watching every drop of blood I do it's it's really interesting I've had uh, it's it's been a lot of pushback and uh, a lot of times people because we're identical twins people are like oh that's the only reason you have a career because you're twins and I'm like because of all the other famous twin directors, right? Like, what the fuck are you talking? I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I would agree. My biggest problem is I'm never considered for directing jobs. Only female directing jobs. I don't want to do female Deadpool. I want to direct Deadpool. I don't want to do Batgirl. I want to do Batman. I think right now we have an overcorrection where an African-American character is only done by an African-American director. Like, a redhead female white girl is doing Black Widow, and I'm like, I mean, I love Black Widow, but should be Deadpool. If I was one dude, I'd be writing Deadpool by now, I think. It's just, Directing it. I think Ryan's actually going to direct the third one. That's yeah. so good for his yeah. ego. He's going to do it! He's going to do it! But that's the end of the trilogy, right? One, two, three. It'll be like the Human Centipede 3. I look forward to it. The final piece. So, the two of you, though, have been uh, trying to help promote women in film and in horror with the, the uh, Women in Horror Month? Yeah. Every February. I know February is in a lot of other months, too, but there's only 12. We had to pick one. It uh, came from the Axe Wound founder, Hannah Neurotica, and right, Hannah is awesome. And uh, what she wanted to do is celebrate and recognize women, women who worked way before us, who paved the way, who are doing it right now, and then also making an environment so we can support new filmmakers so they can get their voices out there. But Jen didn't want it to seem like a charity case, and she's like, 
Well, you can't think horror without thinking blood, and most people don't donate blood because they're scared. And us horror fans aren't scared of anything. So let's put that together and do a blood drive. I can't believe nobody's thought of it before, and you know, it's something free that you can give, and all of us need blood at one time, or somebody that we love will be affected and need, need some blood. It's in you to give. And you know, back in the day, it used to be everyone's civic duty to do it, so the ability to raise awareness for that is just so meaningful to us. And also, we get to cover ourselves in blood at least once a year for good, good cause. Yeah, check out the last one. It was really good. Twin Pool. If you haven't seen Twin Pool, you haven't look seen Twin now. Pool, check it out. We shot it in the Deadpool bar with his crew. <laughs> it's not safe for work, but what we do well, we never is. <laughs> True that. We've got another question from the audience. I'm coming. <laughs> okay, you guys recently, there was a uh, special on Netflix about extreme haunted houses that you guys were featured in. Not just the history of Harder and Eli Roth, but there was, uh, was it Haunters here yeah. in the yard? Yeah, and you guys were talking about your experience with extreme haunted houses. I was hoping you'd talk a little bit more about that and what ideally you would love to see in extreme haunted houses and what would be too much for you? That's a good question. That's a good question. You know, my favorite haunted attractions are the kind that aren't a haunted house. I went to something that was a live action play slash haunt and it was amazing because there was audience interaction. There was a guy who was a spider and you had to crawl through this web. It wasn't just like turn, jump. I'm not really a jump scare woman. I'm into the intimacy of building up the scare. When I'm in a haunt, I usually just sexually harass the scare guys. I'm like, you can't touch me, but maybe after. <laughs> what I've noticed, and I think Darren Lynn Bowsman did this. He had an interactive Play, and the more you let yourself into it, the more you are a part of that horror movie experience. And I love haunted houses, all of them. Even if you, like, you can never scream in public acceptably as an adult, so haunted houses are a real thrill for me. Uh, but it's interesting to see that it's more customary. Like, I loved what we did on Elevator because we did psych profiles and every single person that we had. So we would design the house for that. Imagine that, like, you do a psych profile for everyone who's coming to your haunted house and then you find, oh, all these guys hate clowns and spiders. Okay, these are the ones we're going to invite to this and it's going to be Clown Spider Day. And these guys that are afraid of this stuff will do this kind of thing. As a matter of fact, since Darren did it, Jen and I would love to start doing, like, interactive horror, with, like, haunt houses. Watch out, Darren. Coming for you. So did you come up with the idea for Elevator, or uh, did Game Show Network come to you and say, we want to put a show together? I actually saw a press release come out from Blumhouse for it, and then I started posting it on my social media, like low-key saying I wanted to be in it. Originally, they wanted one screen queen to host, and they wanted it to be LA local. They sure as hell didn't want two Canadian girls that they had to fly in and put up. And it came from this uh, reality show development company called Matador. They also did those sing-off shows. And uh, <laughs> so we didn't have any horror movie directing work at the time. And they go, girls, would you like to do reality television? I'm like, I don't know. And they're like, it's a lot of money. I'm like, OK. <laughs> I remember when I got there, I was like, seriously, guys, just pay a little bit more and get Elvira. <laughs> I thought I was going to be fired every single day. But they did a Skype interview, and it was fun because this is me and Jen. We talk like forever. And then they started laughing me like, oh, they're hired. They're hired. And then they stopped and they're like, no, you have to meet these people. So they flew us everywhere. And I was like, oh, I hope I didn't lose that I'm hired thing by meeting me more. But no, they kept us. They couldn't find anyone better. They had to ask us to not be nice, though. Really? Well, I'm always nice. <laughs> I, it was like a it was like a Canadian vacation to be on Elevator because I got to be very, very nasty. <laughs> Oh, um, do you have a lot of opportunities? Like when it, when you've taken roles in the past and stuff like that, have, has that been like a, a fun opportunity to really stretch outside your regular personalities? It's stress free. Like I love being the talent because they're like, I remember there's a production uh, meeting and I could tell stuff was going down on Elevator and I was like, my director brain, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna come and troubleshoot. And I was like, guys, what's going on? They're like, nothing. And I'm like. There's got to be some problems, and they're like, we just can't decide which outfit you're going to go in because you're so pretty and all of them. I'm like, oh, they lie to me because I'm the talent. Oh, that's so nice. I can just worry about my own shit. I also love to work for my director friends 
like Steve Kostansky, we were in his W's for Wish and ABC's of Death too. And Mickey Keating, aren't we supposed to do something with he him rapped. too? He rapped. Oh. We were shooting a movie. We missed out. I loved. I love just cameoing and acting, usually for directing friends and. I still get offered the same stereotypical shitty twin roles that in every interview I say I don't like to do. And I just wonder, dude, really? They're, they're like, she just doesn't like that role from anyone else but me. I can write that. <laughs> you must think their shitty twin role isn't a shitty twin role. Yeah. Well, now you two wrote yourselves a twin role in American Mary. Yeah. We did! people thought we were kind of twincestual, weird, goth, European chicks. Our editor actually came on the day and met us the day we were shooting and he got the, hey, you gotta respect everyone from the mod community. He thought that was actually us with the tat with the back thing. We, were we had to talk in the German accent because we had the teeth in and you slur unless you were speaking German. It was weird when we came into the editing suite. He was like, oh, you're normal. I'm like, oh, yeah. We do have like one more twin movie we want to do because there's never been a movie where twins wrote it and twins directed it and it was like actual legit twin material. We almost had a twin storyline in Rabbit, but we had to cut it out, which broke my freaking heart. We honestly always have wanted to remake Dead Ringers with, <laughs> with female proctologists. With the Olsen twins, if I could get exactly what I wanted. I keep telling her the Olsen twins will never do the things we're asking. It has to be us. It has to be. If we have to, fine. You know, before we, it, when it's going, we'll offer it. We'll do like a public video saying, hello, Mary Kate and Ashley. I know you're watching. I'm just going to send them flowers every day with the script, one page for each script. It'll be 90 by the end of it. It'll be a three month process. Maybe if we just get like Ashley, we can double her. <laughs> just I need them both, Jen. I need them both. We should get their uh, sister, the Scarlet Witch. Yeah, she looks yeah. ish like them. Ish. Yeah, you could get her and you know whichever Olsen's available. And... That would be trippy. Your sisters twin. Your your two sisters are twins. Now you're playing twins. That would actually be kind of cool. <laughs> um, do we we got another one from the audience? Sir! Oh! It's our future final boy, how are you? Hey, how's it going? Good seeing you again. Thanks again for coming out. You two are awesome. Thank you. Super Thank you. I've been in a dark room for so many weeks. I appreciate all the hugs. <laughs> you might have just answered my question. It was now that you just did Rabbit. Is there any other concept or director that you would look forward to kind of taking their ideas and making them your own movie? Uh, that's a really good question. Oh! Are you not going to answer it first? You are always player one. <laughs> We've really, really been wanting to make a, a film adaptation of one of Chuck Palahniuk's novels. He's the Fight Club guy. <laughs> we have been single-handedly chasing down every single one of them. Uh, we are in talks for snuff because wow. uh, I'm trying to get it out of someone else's hands. Let's just say Chuck and the director that was originally- Don't say it because this is being filmed. Oh, let's just say it didn't work out. Yeah? Yeah, yeah that's good. It just didn't work out. Snuff is fantastic. Invisible Monsters is one of our favorites too. Yes! Yes! But we kind of- I actually had a meeting for Invisible Monsters and the day before I met Chuck and I was like, it's gonna happen, this is all wonderful. And I met Chuck and he went, yeah, Ryan Murphy just bought it and I went, I don't think he has directors attached yet, but there's a lot. I took all the invisible monsters I wanted and put it into Rabbit. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> and Survivor. We'd love to do Survivor. Survivor is about identical twins in a suicide cult that become evangelists. Like, come on. That's, who else is going to do that? It's going with Netflix right now. I've cursed it and I hope they'll hire me. Let's get, oh, let's get another one from the audience here. Here, I'll go this time. No, please. Also, while I'm talking about it, I'd love to remake American Psycho. Yeah! Only with Mary's blessing. So, funny story, David Cronenberg almost made American Psycho. His version was gonna be a legit adaptation from the pages. Anyone who's read that knows, right? That's, uh, it's edgy. <laughs> 
it works. Oh, wow. Okay. Wow. Oh, Better my. late than never. Now we're really young. Um, so my question is, um, with all the previous movies that you had, what was it like working on Rabbit with a bigger budget compared to all of the other ones like American Mary and, and Cena Weaver? So what was it like having a big budget for Rabbit? Almost way worse. Yeah. Way, way worse. <laughs> we, we, um... I will say there's a big difference. Rabbit FYI is an independent film. We didn't have a studio that usually, when we did our two studio movies, they put the budget in an account and then say, don't go over, and you just spend it. When you make an independent film, usually a little comes from here, and a little comes from here, and a little comes from here, and then you get a tax return here, and you get a little bit here, and it trickles. It was very challenging. Yeah, it, it was... It was one of the most challenging movies I had ever made to the point that it wanted me, it made me want to quit making movies forever. And then looking at it afterwards, I was so happy with it. I was like, okay, it's evened out now. It's even, it's good. I'm really grateful for our independent filmmaking roots because if we couldn't roll with the punches like it was dead hooker in a trunk, we would have had some really serious problems. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, and we were so, like Laura, we put her through hell. And she is one of the nicest, most down-to-earth people. And there are things that we did to her that most actors would have been like, yeah, I'm going home. Such a trooper, went through hell, and if it wasn't her, cast as Rose, we would have been able to make the movie that we did. She just held everything together. She was even producing part of it. Like, this girl casting for us. She actually got us one of the actors that we really wanted that has worked with Mr. Cronenberg before. And she just said, oh, do you need so-and-so? Like, can you get me him tomorrow? Yeah, she hooked us up with Fashion Week that ended up helping us for the whole movie. So the fashion stuff is like legit. There were times that I was looking at the clothes being like, please ensure everything because the whole movie is going to go down if anything gets damaged in this. If you thought we were fashionistas by American Mary, we go couture. We go couture! couture! And don't worry, all those beautiful dresses I, I didn't steal, I took. I, er I earned those. I earned those. <laughs> I like that. Taking instead of stealing. I may or may not have a collection of Egyptian silk dead ringer scrubs now. Ooh, wow. Why would you have dead ringer scrubs? Because in Rabbit, it's not just a little touch on that film, it's everything Cronenberg. If you've liked Cronenberg, there's every one of his films is represented in this film. Yay. It's like an Easter egg. Hunt. It's fantastic. And don't watch it once. Once you're going to miss half the movie. The second time you're really going to be like, oh no. Go back, take notes, watch the Easter egg videos online, cross reference, right? I think we're going to have an Easter egg commentary because we're like, this is in the mouth of madness and this is Spider Man 2. Oh, Our costume designer was actually the designer on In the Mouth of Madness. Really? And our attack dogs came from the mouth of madness. It was awesome. We had so much legit word history people there. That movie really freaked me out as a kid. It was fantastic. Yeah, so good. Um, next the Steve question. Steve Johnson effects were crazy. Back when Sam Neill did all these crazy horror movies and most kids are like, Jurassic Park. I'm like, oh no. The possession was like. Oh, when that lady flipped backwards and did Beautiful her transformation. Beautiful effects by Steve oh, Johnson. Yeah. All right, next question. Hi, Clay. Hey, ladies. So, I read that one of your favorite Marvel characters is Deadpool, right? Yeah. Yes, sir. Guilty as charged. So, would you want to be in an actual Deadpool movie, direct one, or do both? Ooh. Wow. You know what? I don't believe in a reality where Deadpool wouldn't pick the twins to be his directors. If Deadpool exists and he'd be like, they're not directing my movie, how hot is the chick that's doing it? And how badly does she want to do me? <laughs> well, I would definitely love to direct. Uh, with all respect to Mr. Reynolds, he has a lot of hats he wears, and I think he needs more time to just enjoy the experience of being Deadpool. And if he had a couple allies that know everything about the books, he'd be able to do that more. And as far as a cameo, I mean, oh my god, I just want to do Deadpool. <laughs> he wakes up with two hot twins in bed. Never referenced again. Fantasy scene. <laughs> Pool of vision. <laughs> it's okay, Ryan, I'll do it with your stunt double. No offense to Blake. Actually, this 
because I'm too stupid to give up. Jen and I are writing a Deadpool script on spec, which yeah. we, and we're gonna send it. We, well, we did twin pull because they said they, we couldn't even have a meeting because we had nothing that looked like a superhero movie on our resume. It was like, okay, so I'm going to do a Deadpool fight with the crew in the bar with everything legit. Yeah, because Patty Jenkins had so much superhero stuff on her reel, right? It doesn't matter. I'm different. I gotta go my own way. <laughs> so I'm going to send it for spec, hopefully. I don't know. I mean, from the girls who helped make the porno, I feel like that would be our credit. We helped write the Deadpool porno that's out right now. You're welcome. Really? You're welcome. It's out right now. It's starring Seth Gamble. And they, they got the actual Deadpool costume people to make the costume. I, I like guys, I can't even. Like it's, it's so funny. He has a beautiful moment with the Punisher. I'll leave it there. I'll give you one reason for you know how Deadpool is self-aware? So he realizes that he's popular enough that he's getting his own porn parody and he's so excited he's talking to the crew and he's like, it's happening! <laughs> enjoy. So enjoy the porno. <laughs> Directed that, by the amazing Axel Braun, not Axel me. Braun directed. He is awesome. I was gonna say that that sound bite's gonna make the highlight real. Enjoy, <laughs> enjoy the porno. <laughs> enjoy the porno. All right, next question. All right, Jim, what is your actual favorite comic book character, Sylvia? Why is your favorite comic book character Air Star from Preacher? And Shelby wants to know what you think of Ronda Rousey versus Charlotte Flair, maybe Lena Vinny WrestleMania next year. Wait, what was the last one? Oh, Charlotte Flair versus Ronda Rousey, maybe main eventing WrestleMania next year. Charlotte's gonna kick her ass. Woo! Charlotte! Woo! Woo! First of all, Ronda was Ronda was starting shit with my twins. Mm -mm. Uh-uh, girl. I ain't in the UFC no more. Yeah, You're on no, 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 no. no one picks fights with the Bellas except for me and Chet. That's it. We're gonna WrestleMania and I'll break female tag team champions. They're gonna break me in that. half, but I bring Kane and Big Show with me, so I gotta fight a chance. Okay, in all fairness though, the Bellas totally turned on Ronda in the whatever, ring. Whatever, whatever you Dude, don't understand. Have you met the Bellas? That's what they do. Complicated. They're complicated, fiery women. But to also answer your question, favorite comic book character? Uh, I don't know if you know Wolverine's son, Dawkin. Yeah. He's amazing pansexual, that kid with pheromone control that has sexy times with Bullseye, who is such a homophobe. It's, it's hot when they kiss. It's really I love hot. him. I remember reading this and being like, oh yeah, Wolverine has a cool son. How stupid is this? And then he starts making out with Bullseye, and I'm like, oh, something for me. <laughs> and my um, absolute other hand of the scale is uh, it's Daredevil. I love Daredevil as a character. I love that he's one of the only superheroes that still gets to keep his flaws and his challenges because a superhero without hardship is nothing. If you're not watching Daredevil season three, holy yeah, God. born again, wow. yeah. And oh my God, they cast such a sexy bullseye. I'm conflicted. The reason why I like Aerostar. Have you guys ever read Preacher? Preacher yeah. the comics. Preacher the comics. Yeah. If you're liking the show, please pick up the comics because the comics are beautiful high art. When I, that was the first time I ever saw adult content in a comic book. I remember how Tulip was older than Jesse, and I'd never seen an older woman with a younger man. I was like, what is this? But Air Star got me. There is a panel where he's being introduced, and he goes, "Kill the women first. And what he's doing is he's talking about what to do in a terrorist situation. And what he goes on to tell his superiors, if you're in a terrorist situation and there's a woman terrorist there, she had to be so overqualified to even be in there that she's deadly as hell. So you have to kill her right away. And that became my work mantra, actually. I was like, oh, wow. That's how you have to go into everything. You have to be the most scariest, deadliest, be aggressive, and get yourself in. But my favorite, favorite character is uh, Deadpool because we're both silly asses and we're judged on what we look like. And we're both pretty miserable, but we're funny as fuck. <laughs> All right, next question. I am the mouth. You guys look amazing! Okay, so I was hearing about your sheep everywhere, by the way. Yeah. Nice. But not bad. So I'm Jack's mouthpiece and she wants to know if there's going to more seasons of Elevator, or if you guys are doing any new horror-themed game shows at all. Oh. So Elevator is in purgatory. They haven't canceled us, but we haven't been resurrected. 
They were waiting for the world to seem like a happier place because they're afraid maybe elevator will push it over the edge. It won't, it won't. We need to laugh at people being scared. Elevator is pure joy. Pure joy. We want a heck of vader for young people. We wanted to do a family version because we found friends would turn on each other like that. But family, you are not allowed to. Uh, we do have a new game show that we are pitching out right now. It was something we were, because <clears throat> on Elevator is always not my circus, not my monkeys. I would pitch them so many ideas. I'd be like, let's get Kane in here. And we have a hallway and we build walls and we have doors and they have keys and they have to go through. But Kane just bashes. He smashes through the door, walls. After door after door after door after door after door. They're like, no. And I was like, what about? Halloween episode. Bruce Campbell, Elvira come into the lair and say, get out of here, girls. Now you do the hell And then we're the ones who get to go. And they wouldn't do that either. And I was like, if I could make any game show, what would it be? And I started thinking about our lives and we've really put all of our everything into our careers and not really anything into our love life. So we came up with a concept that's Fear Factor meets The Bachelorette called the Final Boy. Because nobody's good enough to date my sister. Nobody's good enough to date my sister. And when you're in a horror movie situation, you really get to know a person. You know if you can spend 20 years with them. So we put them in a haunted location, either the Stanley Hotel, Sleepaway Camp, maybe something just legitimately the Winchester Mansion, who the hell knows. And a way to terrify them, we do the whole Big Brother thing. And we make them compete in Fear Factor challenges to win dates with us. But when they win a date, what they don't know is actually another horror scenario. So for example, we're in a hot tub and it starts to get sexy and we hear a noise and I'm like, uh, I'm in a bikini, get the hell out and check or you're out. What they don't know is the other twin is directing the horror movie experience outside with all the cues, all the camera, all the everything, while the other one is directing from within the scenario. And then we see if they're brave enough, you know, to do it. And then before we start, we cast all of their heads so then, if they don't make the cut, we cut their head off, put it on the wall, and we say, sorry, see you next time. <laughs> that sounds really great. Thank I you. Like it. So. <laughs> next question. My question is, where's your puppy? Oh, thank oh, you. Right. I was told I wasn't allowed to bring my service dog, Princess Diana, so I left her at home. Oh. She'll only come here and see everyone with their service dog. And I'm like, is it because she's a Rottweiler? I don't think She's coming it. next year. I'm bringing her next year. Princess yeah. Diana will come with me everywhere. She loves everyone. She's actually a service to everybody. Anyone that's feeling sad, she rushes over to and gives kisses. Like, she's a little angel. If you ever meet Princess Diana, you go, you give her a head, you go, go like this and go boop, and she'll give you a, like a nose boop. It's yeah. a fist bump. Yeah, she's going to boop. It makes her really cool in the office, like, yeah. She's up in Toronto enjoying my beautiful corner suite flat apartment. Yeah, she's living the real life. I left her with an actor and I keep checking to make sure she's okay. So far, so good. Your direction is to not kill my dog. <laughs> I was so interested to come and see her because... I'm so sorry. Body lover myself. Got you as a friend on Facebook and I see pictures and I'm like, oh, so beautiful. I want to be back every year for Spooky Empire, so you can get a year-old Rottweiler next year. I'll be here. Thank you. And love to your dog. Next question. Hi. Hi. The devil wears Prada. <laughs> Nailed it. Anyways, um, I was wondering, what's the spookiest thing that's ever happened to you, or scariest, either on set or off? So uh, we shot See No Evil and Vendetta in the same partially closed insane asylum. It's called Riverview. It's very famously used for it. It's partially open, which means you have to be careful because sometimes uh, the people that are patients there see the food trucks and they come and they sit with the crew and they just hang out and you can't really tell the difference because everybody's kind of been working really long. Uh, <laughs> the scariest thing was when we were sh Spoiler alert if you haven't seen Sino Evil 2, but there's a kissing scene in it. And there was a rule at this facility that nobody is allowed to touch each other. Patience. And uh, 3 a.m. is the satanic witching hour. I hate shooting during 3 a.m. Stupid stuff always happens during 3 a.m. So we start shooting the kissing scene. And every time 
Kai and Daniel Harris leaned in. It sounded like someone was banging, like bang, 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 like everywhere. It sounded like they were hammering, and I was like, I thought it was another production. Like, can you hold the word? Or it was my own crew. I was like, what is going on? It happened the whole hour, only when, and then the producer was like, it's not happening. Kissing. It's not happening. He's like, we waited, and we're like, guys, go in for a kiss. Bang, 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 bang. As soon as it was for, it was done. But our producer left early. He was like, yeah, you know what? I think you guys have it. It was a great way to get rid of a producer. <laughs> but it was, it's spooky there. Um, one thing is you'd hear somebody calling your name and then you'd end up in a part way alone. Like I remember I ended up on one side of the facility and my AD ended up on the other because he heard me calling him and I heard him calling me. It's just, it's a fun place to get murdered, I guess. <laughs> Hi. Um, Hi. I was curious if uh, you had the opportunity to do a documentary, not a making up documentary, but just a documentary on your favorite subject or a subject that you feel passionate about, what it would be. Wow. I always wanted to do a documentary about exorcisms and not just in Catholicism, but internationally in other religions and other countries. I think it's absolutely fascinating. I think it's really interesting that there is an aspect of belief in spirituality that existed before now. Now we don't. Now you're made fun of if you believe in anything beyond what you see. And back in the day, I mean, they took rights against like demons, and there it was very serious business if you thought that something was haunting you or anything. So I want to get back to the root of that. I want to get back to the root of where this evil came from, and I also want to examine the difference between psychology and when someone is mentally unwell. And when there is a disturbance in the spirit, because I have seen disturbances in the spirit as well, as much as I would love to have sat in on an exorcism, I'm in the wrong religion to be allowed to sit in on it. But I think it's a very fascinating and very amazing uh, subject. And especially, we don't talk very nicely about priests. There's some priests that I love. When we were, Sylvan and I were two of the first female altar servers in Canada. And one of our priests was Father Mendenhall, and he was this amazing, huge Russian guy who was also a twin that just happened to be an exorcist as well. And we would beg him to tell us stories, and he always would. And it just was so utterly fascinating to me. If there was ever a man of God that could fight the devil, this big Russian dude was him. You, any documentaries do you want to do? I do want to do a documentary, but it's a bummer. Oh boy, here we go. It's about priests again. You know? Oh, this can go in a very oh, obvious direction. Oh, no, yeah, no, two but... Different uh, signs there. They're both priest ones. Uh, mine, uh, the priest that we have actually at my uh, church right now, he is uh, also worked for uh, the archdiocese, and he would prosecute pedophile priests. Because there's no conversation about what those priests who would never do that feel about the ones that are, and the cover-up that's going on there. And I thought that was so interesting and so heated because what the church has right now is an opportunity to lead by example. Everyone else is feeling this. this it's not just a church thing. This kind, of, this kind of sickness is everywhere. But if they were the ones to say, hey, this is horrible, we're going to take care of the victims, and we're going to take care of everyone, and we're going to start healing the community, I think that would be interesting. I think this documentary would be a good way to start it to see. Because right now, you can't even talk about a Catholic priest without it being a joke. Those are a lot of men and women uh, in that religion that are really wonderful, great people. And I want to I want to shine a light on the revolution that might be going on internally that you wouldn't normally see. Because the church is kind of secret of, of when they do stuff like this. It's a bummer. I think it would be good, though. I think it would be good. I'll make a double feature. Ah, yours is joy. Yours is marketable. You're like, I'm so sorry, Father. And have you done exorcisms? No, you just prosecuted a pet. I'm sorry. You're Let coming to Silv's talk. You get in that line, you're in this that documentary. Line, you're in this that line, that line. We have another question. Hi. It's me Hi. again. Hello. Um, would you ever consider doing found footage kind of things? Wow, I would love to do a found footage film. Have you ever heard of a film called Man Bites Dog? Yeah. 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 Man Bites Dog is an amazing found footage film because it's... The speaker didn't think so. Was that me? Excuse me. 
I love it when a found footage film is found footage because it's telling the story. That's why I wish I had been the one to remit and do Sinister 2. I love the use of found footage in the original Sinister. I admire the marketing campaign of Paranormal Activity. I admire a little else of that. Uh, I thought something like Man Bites Dog is revolutionary because it was about how a documentary team can't ever be truly objective when they're following something. I would love to do a found footage film that isn't just because I can't get a bigger budget because it's part of the actual style. I would love to do uh, probably a witchcraft movie. Woo! Yeah, we had the witchcraft movie was found footage. I was trying to think of it while you were answering. Oh, yeah? we did have a, I was like, we do have a found footage one. Which one is it? Oh yeah. The, we have a, a witch movie that we wanted to do about a, a group of girls that go on a road trip down to Salem and uh, they end up in Salem in the past and they think they're witches. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but if you like found footage, Ashlyn Clark's Devil's Doorway is on IFC. I think you can get it on, on iTunes right now. It's found footage and it's scary as hell. And she is the first woman in Northern Ireland to do a feature film. So please, please support her. She's so fucking talented. And she's got a short film called Childer also, which is also brilliant. And you know, we're gonna be, have to be wrapping it up pretty soon here, but- um, no! I know. Ah, this time Sorry, just goes guys. so fast, you know? But you know, one thing I was wondering is, okay, there are all these different sub-genres of horror and stuff, whether it's like a haunted house or a monster or something like that. What are your favorite types of horror subgenre? I love home invasion. Like funny games, I love that movie Woo! so much. So much. Why did you give them eggs? You should have gotten them out of the door. Now with your Tim Roth is dead now, Craig. There is a, a little respected and little known subgenre that I like to call they dig in the ground and accidentally end up in hell. Jen loves on if you go underground in a movie, oh. Jen loves that. That's her oh. favorite. Like what are they going to find in there? She never knows. There's an Australian movie called The Tunnel. The Tunnel, uh, very not really well released uh, in America, but amazing. As above, so below, that was also a good version. But there's there are so many amazing, they accidentally, uh, the, the Descent. Wow. Yes. That's fantastic. Yes. One day I'm going to make a movie and they're going to go like spurlanking or something. You're like, ah, oh, I know where this is going. I just love it, and you really, really need to see the tunnel because it's an independent film, and there are a few effects in it that you never, ever see in a mainstream film, and there's shots that are done in sequence where you go past a room, and then you hear a sound effect, and you come back into the room, and something has happened in that room. It's just so disturbing. It's fantastic. The tunnel. And I think I always will love body horror, and our next thing might be a werewolf movie, so pray for us that we get the job. It's really, it's really fun one. I love almost all exorcism movies too. Yeah. And I always stop and I'm like, oh, it's not as good as The Exorcist. Well, what like, is? Wait, did we just say the same thing at the same time? Twinning! Jinx. Uh -huh. Oh, we go. <laughs> what kind of coke? I don't have that kind of budget. <laughs> Diet coke? <laughs> <laughs> And on that note, I had such a fun time up here. I'm pretty sure these guys all had a fun time too. Thank you. You guys are the best. Thank you for being here. I'm sorry it was so, so challenged for us to come to Spooky, but please ask for us back. We'd love to be back. And we would love to have you. And we're going to go change into our twin pool costumes and go to the party tonight, so I hope to see all of you there. I hope we get to do that right I hope so. <laughs> Bye guys! Woo! This is One Broke Gamer Girl. I just want to say a big thank you for watching this video. If you liked what you just watched, then go ahead and hit that like button down below. One more thing, since you've already hit the like button down below, You've already hit the like button down below, right? Well then, why not go ahead and go one step further and leave a comment too? Since you've already hit the like button and left a comment, you did both of those already, right? Then why not just take one more tiny little step and hit the subscribe button as well? 
Just one more thing, since we've already come this far, would you kindly check out the links in the description? That way you can follow me on Twitter, Twitch, and maybe even check out my blog.